Hey there, so before I get into this month's lightning round video, I just wanna say that um, I just got back from doing some traveling. I went in New York for Educon and then to San Diego for Fully Charged Live, and I think I may have gotten to meet more followers of this channel and shake more hands with people than I've ever had a chance to do in a specific amount of time. For all of those that I got to meet, I just wanted to say it was really great to meet you. Thanks for coming up and for all the kind words and stuff, but there was this one sentiment that I kept hearing from people, and um, it really kind of put me on my heels a little bit. I had so many people come up to me and say that what they like about my channel is that I cover a wide range of like random topics and stuff like that. And let me tell you something, that's my favorite part of doing this channel. Like it can be really easy to get pigeonholed on YouTube. The algorithm tends to want to like put people in silos, you know, and say that, you know, if you talk about this, we'll show it to people. But if you talk about that, we're not going to do it. And uh, I mean, let me tell you right now, if that's what I went by alone, I would not be enjoying this. In fact, the channel would probably grow a lot faster if I just stuck to one thing, but um, it'd be a lot less interesting, wouldn't it? But I can only cover all these weird and wonderful things about the world because you guys keep coming back. Like, you, you let me do it. You trust that if I talk about something that you're gonna find it interesting too or you're gonna dig my take on it or whatever. But anyway, I just wanted to thank all of you for having that trust in me and for coming along with me on this ride. Um, it, it's only because you keep coming back that I get to do this. Besides, I get a lot of my video ideas from you guys in the comments and social media posts and stuff, and uh, of course, from Patreon members in lightning round videos like this. Thomas Loves asked, what do you think the future of the British monarchy will be now that the Queen died? Will Charles be a good king? Hmm. You know, as an ungrateful colonial, I don't think I really am qualified to talk about this. Like, what is exactly the value of the monarchy now? Like, wh what makes a good king in 2022? Like, I say all the time that here in the United States, we don't really have anything like a royal family. Whenever I say that, people always, like, point at the Kardashians, which is mostly cynical. It's a cynical thing to say, but I, I think it's also apt. I think there's a lot of people in the UK that feel that way about the royal family, too, that they're just kind of like freeloaders and just kind of famous for being famous. But I think it's value, and I think the reason that it gets kept around so much is that it is it is an actual link to like a thousand years of history, you know, and that that's a comforting thing to a lot of people. And and we just we we don't have anything like that here in the United States. I mean, as for Charles, uh, I mean, he he's a pretty uninspiring figure for the most part. Uh, you know, he's got he's got some sympathy right now because his mother just died and all that. Whether he maintains that sympathy is, we'll see. But I was actually at Educon when the when the uh, the news hit, and um, like Dr. Becky was there, and I got to hang out with her, which was really cool. But yeah, she was talking about how like she had read, um, you know, in the little on the news that day that the the king and the king's consort were on their way to Buckingham Palace or whatever, and and she said she just was like the king, the king, like she just couldn't wrap her head around that. It's just that that's not a term she had ever heard used in her home country. Uh, and it was just kind of weird. I thought that was, I don't know, interesting take. Brian Beswick said, I don't even have a question on this one. I just thought this was cool. Diamond rain in Uranus, insert joke here. No thanks, I don't want to insert anything into Uranus. Now, Brian sent me this article. Um, this is from phys.org. This is about a, uh, an experiment that was done at the Department of Energy's SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of acronyms in this, just bear with me. But basically what they did was they fired lasers into cheap PET plastics, as you can see right here. Because apparently the chemicals in PET plastics actually kind of somewhat resemble the kind of chemicals that you see in the atmospheres of ice giants like Neptune and Uranus. And, and what this basically did was by firing this high powered laser into this plastic, it sort of like forced a pressure wave out from it. And that pressure uh, created nano diamonds. It was strong enough to actually crush the, the, the molecules down into diamonds. And again, this sort of simulates what happens on gas giants because they're so big and their gravity is so strong that um, the, the atmosphere becomes so pressurized that these particular chemicals get crushed down into nano diamonds that then sort of accumulate to form diamonds apparently like millions of carats in size. And then these millions of carats fall down to the planet forming what they call a bling ring around the planet. But yeah, apparently oxygen has a lot to do with this. As it says right here, the researchers used a high-powered optical laser at the Matter and Extreme Conditions, or MEC, experiment at SLAC's LINAC Coherent Light Source, or LCLS, to create shock waves in the PET. And then they probed what happened to the plastic with x-ray pulses from the LCLS. So yeah, the, the uh, MEC instrument at SLAC's uh, uh, at LCLS LINAC department uh, shock waves into the PET to create x-rays. 
or something like that. I don't know why people find science so unapproachable. Now, that's interesting, and, and you might just be like, that's whatever, that's fine, Joe, but um, it actually has some real applications, nano diamonds do. Um, apparently, they can be used in drug delivery, medical sensors, non-invasive surgery, sustainable manufacturing, and quantum electronics. So I have a little bit better understanding of what happens on ice giants, but it can also help us right here on Earth. Claudio Souza asked, hey, Joe, will you upload your mind to the machine once it's possible? Yes or no, and why? <laughs> yeah, d this, is, uh, this is the old teleportation problem. Like, I really struggle with this because if you upload your consciousness to a machine or a computer, um, you're not really getting to experience that yourself. You're just kind of creating a replica of yourself. And I have two problems with that. One, I don't actually get to experience it. My replica does. And two, I'm not sure the world needs two of me. I did a video a long time uh, ago that kind of hypothesized a way to like turn your brain into hardware that could then be sort of inserted into the machine so that it doesn't rely on uploading or replication or anything like that. It can all kind of stay contained in your brain, but then you can become a part of this sort of machine or meta world that winds up getting created. Um, it's very sci-fi. I'll, I'll put a link down below. Megan Betts asked, do you think we're living in a white hole? If so, does that mean we're not living in a simulation? Or does that mean that the black hole is the main processor for our simulation? Um... Okay, so if my understanding is right, and this is a big if, um, the idea of a white hole universe is that uh, the big bang and the expansion of the universe that we have all been able to experience and observe, uh, it might just be like the outgassing of a black hole from another universe creating a white hole that our universe was born out of. It's kind of just another way to explain, you know, where all this came from. Now this does kind of collide with holographic theory because um, you know the idea that matter is compressed into a black hole and it spews out in some other universe, well holographic theory suggests that all the information that falls into a black hole gets encoded on the event horizon and then it gets radiated out slowly over trillions of years through Hawking radiation. What this has to do with simulation theory, I'm, on, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. So there's an idea that's been floating around in my head for a while, this is probably more science fiction than science science, but um, well, whatever, here goes. So I've covered antimatter before, and the big question around antimatter is where is it? Like, th that's the mystery. Where is all the antimatter? Because the idea is that at the beginning of the universe in the Big Bang, um, it should have created equal parts matter and antimatter, because you have like one thing being split in two, so you have anti and anti. And, uh, and we don't see that anywhere. Like, there's, there's not really been any antimatter left behind. Because matter and antimatter cancel each other out, what, what in theory should have happened was you would have created all this and then it would have just come back together in a massive explosion and left nothing. Kind of gets to that whole philosophical argument of like, why is there something instead of nothing? But the fact of the matter is there is something. Um, there's possibly an infinite universe of something, but we don't hardly see any antimatter. So, so that's the mystery. So one of the explanations for why that is, is that there was a very slight imbalance at the beginning of the universe where there's maybe like a billion and one parts of matter to a billion parts of antimatter and when it all collided that one part that was left over is the universe that we see today. Meaning this infinite universe that we currently have is only a billionth of what should have been created. Which is mind blowing to think about. But another way of looking at antimatter is that it's regular matter traveling backwards in time. I've covered this in a video before. So when you see a timeline of the universe like this, it maybe should be shown like this, with our universe traveling in one direction on the arrow of time and an antimatter universe traveling in the opposite direction. Of course, the problem with this visualization is that time doesn't move physically in one linear direction. It travels out in all directions at once, so it might be more accurate to imagine a second parallel universe exactly like ours, expanding right alongside ours, made of antimatter in a separate dimension of sorts, a dimension reversed in time. So, in this scenario, the idea of a black hole punching through uh, to the parallel universe, like what you're talking about, um, it wouldn't look like a white hole to the people in the other universe. It would look like a black hole because they are reversed in time. It's still matter coming into the black hole. Meaning what we experience as black holes on our side of the universe uh, were, would actually kind of be white holes to them, if that makes sense, because we're reversed in time. And where that gets really sticky is that if, if that were the case, then the universe would probably be deterministic because this other universe, to, from our perspective, is traveling backwards in time, so the future has already happened for them. This broke me. Uh, the dot over the eye. That broke me. I'm... I'm done. Earthbound Martian asked, as a creator, what do you think is the biggest thing you can bring to others' lives? What do you feel it means to create in today's world? Judging by that last segment, it, it's breaking people's brains.
Uh, I don't know. The simplest answer, I think, is the best thing that we can do as creators is to help others feel less alone. Like, there's a reason why you can find pretty much everything in the world on YouTube, because no matter how weird or unique you might think you are and you think your interest may be, I promise you, whatever it is, there are millions of other people out there that have the same interest. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a weird dichotomy, because we are all living very unique and specific lives and have unique and specific perspectives and experiences, but we're, at the same time, a lot more alike than we think. And maybe you spent your entire life thinking you were different or alone because of this. Maybe it made you feel ostracized or disconnected. And then you hear some, you know, random person from somewhere else in the world nerding out over the same thing. And it's like a magic trick. You're like, holy crap, this guy's into that too? Like in the earliest days of my channel, most of my videos were, uh, well, a lot more like this. I would literally take questions from the comments and answer them, hence Answers with Joe. But after a while, I just began to sort of trust that, you know, if there was something that I was interested in, that you guys would be interested in it too. And, um... Yeah, that's, that's pretty much proven to be true. Not all of you like every single video that I do, obviously, but that's just been an interesting little side effect of this whole thing. So yeah, the lesson that I've learned is that if you just, you know, put yourself out there and be true to yourself as much as possible, you're just kind of, you're putting ripples into the universe. And, um, you know, you never know where those ripples will land and, and how they'll affect other people. And, and I don't think you need a YouTube channel to do that. That's true in life as well. Cole Parker asks, one could say that Elon's companies cover critical needs on Mars, but what about waste management? Humans produce tons of trash, literally. Will the second permanent structure on Mars be the first extraterrestrial garbage dump, or does Musk and others have some high-tech solution to burning, reusing, or reprocessing waste? Oh, come on. It's an entire planet. What can we possibly do to an entire planet? Yeah, I did a video a while back where I imagined how much waste would be created on the trip to Mars, and I joked that the, uh, the way to Mars would just basically become a giant skid mark. Um, that was a joke worth repeating. But yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've been learning on the ISS over the last 20 years is how to do exactly this kind of thing, you know, learning how to build and live in an enclosed system. Um, of course, there are some things that we still haven't quite gotten down. Like, astronauts famously recycle their urine on the ISS, hence the phrase, today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. But uh, solid waste and uh, a lot of other consumables, they don't get recycled. They just kind of get put on cargo ships that then just burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Earth, the ultimate landfill. But this is not going to be an option on Mars, or, or on the moon for that matter. Now, landfills are obviously an option, and it may just come down to that, but NASA is also working on some ideas to deal with waste in a, uh, a much more useful way. In fact, earlier this year, they launched a few challenges to the public to, so that they could sort of submit ideas along these lines. So there were a few different challenges that they had uh, going on. One is called the Waste to Base Materials Challenges, Sustainable Processing in Space. Uh, and this seeks ideas to convert waste into useful resources like propellant or raw materials for 3D printing. Uh, participants are asked to share their ideas for managing, converting, or processing a few specific categories of waste, including trash, fecal waste, foam packaging, and carbon dioxide. The other one is a tongue twister, but it's called the Trash to Gas Ash Management Challenge. So this one says that it seeks designs concepts for an effective method of removing ash from full-scale trash to gas reactor in microgravity or for later use as disposal. Yeah, this is kind of looking at what to do with the leftover from gas plasmification of uh, waste disposal stuff. And the last one is the Waste Jettison Mechanism Challenge. So this is more of a space-based thing, but they're seeking concepts to uh, safely eject materials from a crewed spacecraft. Jettisoned objects would then safely orbit the sun so as not to contaminate celestial bodies or interfere with future space missions. So these challenges have closed. Um, I tried to find who the winners were and what their ideas were, but I, I couldn't find them. Um, if you happen to know, you can share them in the comments, please. But the point is, NASA is working on this. Now, as for Elon and SpaceX, I couldn't find any plans that they had. I found a lot of articles that were very critical of their plans because of the, all the waste issues and stuff. But um, yeah, if there's something out there that I missed, uh, feel free to share in the comments. I imagine the most likely options would be like plasma gasification to get energy out of it, or just like purposefully using consumable goods that break down organically or can be recycled or used for 3D printing for construction and stuff like that. Um, as for human waste, well, there's always potatoes. It has been seven days since I ran out of ketchup. And Robin asked, a certain PBS YouTube broadcast mentioned a study found that dogs poop in a north-south alignment. All I can find on the internet seems to trace back to a study of 70 dogs. How does your dog do what she do do so well? Robin's always on the, uh, on the, on the, on the poop train for some reason. Okay, so um, I'm gonna state categorically, I, I don't think this is a thing. I don't believe this. I just, I don't. I don't believe this. I don't. But I did start paying attention to how my dogs align themselves when they do their business, when I take them outside in the backyard um, since I got this question. 
and I've seen them poop four times, and they were facing south each time. I still don't believe this. I'm done. So yeah, that's weird. That's, that's weird. You know what's weirder? Wi-Fi. Especially when you're staying in a hotel, when you're traveling. Like, you, you, you don't know who's been on that network. You don't know who's been on the bed either, but at least you know they clean the sheets. So if you're using Wi-Fi in strange places, you should have a way to clean that dirty, dirty signal. And that's where today's sponsor comes in, NordVPN. NordVPN is like detergent for Wi-Fi. It'll take that filthy Wi-Fi and scrub it with a power detergent and emollients to give it a soft clean. That's not, that's not, that's not how a VPN works. It actually works by creating a virtual private network that hides your IP address by tricking the network into thinking that you're somewhere else, basically. And it keeps your information safe and out of the hands of bad actors. In other words, Steven Seagal will not get access to your information. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I basically just live off my laptop and the idea that someone might, you know, get their hands on it and all the information that's inside of it is, uh, it's horrifying. And the best part about NordVPN is I can actually protect my laptop from my own stupid self with threat protection. Threat protection works even when your VPN isn't turned on, protecting your browser from malicious websites, trackers, malware, even intrusive ads. No more clicking on the wrong thing and then crying for three days. Now, joking aside, online privacy is under more threat than ever, and the best way to protect yourself is with a VPN. So if you haven't taken that leap because you've just been putting it off or think it's too difficult, give NordVPN a try. Um, they've been doing this for a really long time. They've made it really simple to get started. And if you go to nordvpn.com slash Scott, you can get a two-year plan plus four additional months with a huge discount, and they've got a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you don't like it for whatever reason, you won't lose a dime. It's totally risk-free. Not signing up, trust me, is, uh, it's very risk expensive. So give it a try, you got nothing to lose. Once again, it's nordvpn.com slash Scott. I'll put a handy link down in the description. Go check it out. Big thanks to NordVPN for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are keeping things going. going blah, 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 blah. Big thanks to NordVPN for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are just forming an awesome community, being super helpful uh, and keeping the lights on around here. I can't thank you guys enough. We got some new channel members to shout out real quick. We've got Hanok Avni, uh, Dusan Majernik, Kara Davies, Crystal Spicer, all equipped, or AI equipped, all I write is free, interesting. Um, Elisa Richard, uh, Brett Lavalley, Andrew M. Gross, MD, Carson McQuestion, Andrew Schuler, EJ Barrow, uh, sorry, there's a few to get through here, uh, Naburius N., John Stewart, Jason McFeeters, Ramon Hi Jaimez, Mai Tran, Luis Blanco, Rodriguez, Marcy Lee Murray, Roland Arthur Aldridge, Purple Frequency, Scott Rudowski, May Quackers, Bridget Chancy, and Elaine Silvestra. Whew. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you would like to join them and get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and get a cool little uh, button next to your name in the comments, makes you stand out, makes you look cooler than everybody else. Uh, just hit the little join button down below and that'll get you started. All right, please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video because uh, YouTube thinks you might like that one or any of the others on the side that have my face on them. Uh, you can go check those out. If you like them, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and uh, I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.